I always thought of oils as the ultimate plein air painting medium. Until a new kind of paint dropped into my life. At Stonecrop Gardens in Cold Spring, New York, the most recognizable feature is the conservatory building. I'll try to capture it in a classic painting medium called casein. I've got to make two important decisions before I start painting. One is, where do I stand in relation to the subject and how much do I include in the painting? Should I paint the conservatory with a little space around it? Or crop into it? I can tell by holding up a little viewfinder. I'll be using a home-built tripod-mounted easel and I'll work standing. The surface is a canvas covered panel primed with white gesso, just like you might use if you were painting in oil. Some painters use an umbrella to diffuse or soften the harsh sunlight, but I made a homemade diffuser using kite sticks and white nylon. You can find out more about this type of easel at the Facebook group called Sketch Easel Builders or on my Gumroad tutorial link below. Before I actually bring out the paints, I start by drawing in the main lines of the architecture directly on the gessoed surface. I want to get that pyramidal tower right, so I draw the center line. And I want to get the basic silhouette of the building. I also want to know where the eye level or horizon line is, because that's where the vanishing points of the perspective will go. I don't draw every detail, just the main planes of the building. And as I'm drawing, I'm thinking about what I'll be doing with the painting. What's light and dark? What is bright colored? What's neutral? If you watch others of my YouTube videos, you know sometimes I use other media like gouache, watercolor, or oil, and sometimes I draw this in with a brush. But this time, I'll be using casein. Casein comes in tubes, very much like oil paints, but it uses water as its solvent. I put down a piece of damp paper towel to keep the paint alive longer. This is titanium white, cadmium yellow light, golden ochre, cerulean blue, ultramarine blue, cadmium red scarlet, and Venetian red. What makes casein different is it uses milk protein as its glue-like binder. Every kind of paint has a binder. That's what holds the paint together. It makes it stick to itself and to the surface you're painting on. With gouache, it's gum arabic, which can be dissolved after the paint is dry. With oil, it's linseed oil. With acrylic, it's acrylic polymer. The reason I like the binder or the emulsion in casein is it's just strong enough to seal the surface when the paint dries, seal it from later layers, but it's not so strong that it wrecks your brushes. I begin with a few light blue patches for the sky. When those are dry, in a few minutes, I'll overpaint them with leafy texture. Meanwhile, I'm going to paint some of the dark tones around the outside of the conservatory. Casein is a very old paint, much older than oil or watercolor. Archaeologists have found examples of ochre on some tools mixed with a milk protein it goes back 49,000 years. That's older than the domestication of animals. So it may have been human milk that they used as the binder. Scientists have also found pigments held together with milk proteins going back to ancient Chinese and Egyptian sources. But in modern times, both gallery artists and illustrators have used casein. It was often used by gallery painters as an underpainting medium for painting the first layers before going ahead with the final oil surface. And it's been used in the theatrical world for painting sets and even for house paints. Now the gesso surface is just resistant to absorption enough to allow these textures to float on the surface. So I can suggest the texture of leaves in the trees without having to paint them all individually. You could do the same thing in oil with an oil primed ground but this is faster and it dries faster, so I don't have to carry home a wet painting in a special panel carrier that could get damaged in transit. 
especially valuable to have something that dries quickly when you're sketching in other countries or you have to travel by air. I'll use this big house painting brush to suggest these textures. The textures of leaves are lighter at the top edge and then a little darker toward the bottom edge of the foliage masses. I want to find a quick way to lay in these foliage masses because I want to get down to the detail of the architecture. So I'm using this big rough bristle brush. It's a house painting brush from a hardware store using yellow ochre and cad yellow and cerulean blue. I can get some of that warm color of the foliage and since it floats on the surface sometimes it sinks into the texture of the canvas. Another major benefit of casein and a reason a lot of artists switch to it later in life is that it doesn't have the toxic mineral solvents that oils do and that makes cleanup a lot easier too. Now I can go in and touch those edges of the leaves going over the sky color. Since it's dry, I don't have to worry about picking up the color of that sky. With the oil, I'd have to be much more careful not to pick up these layers and get them all blending into each other. One reason a lot of people who've tried casein don't like it is because it's, they say it's chalky. It dries matte, and that means that when it dries, the darks look dull and pasty. But there's nothing that says that you can't varnish it at the end. And I'll show you at the end how I varnish this to make it look just like an oil painting and to make it possible to frame without glass. This is especially important if the overall key of the painting is dark. There you don't want to have a matte surface. You want to have a rich varnish surface. You can actually mix in acrylic gloss medium and paint with that combined with casein. But remember, if you have any acrylic medium, it will have the same effect on your brushes that acrylic has of drying hard into your brushes. But if the overall key of the painting is light, sometimes that matte surface can look beautiful and it photographs well. If you like to paint with thick impastos or textural strokes that stick out from the surface of the board, it might be a good idea to mix some casein emulsion in with your paint to give it more strength. It's also important to work on a rigid surface like a board or a panel or a canvas panel, but not something that's too flexible like paper or canvas. I've got to move now from the foliage to the building itself because I'm about an hour into the painting and I haven't even yet started the central focus of the picture, which is the building. It's an interesting kind of postmodern structure because it combines the glass and steel of a typical Victorian conservatory with some solid walled elements, the dormers on the side and on the end of this cross-shaped plan. It was built fairly recently, in 1997, to house the collection of delicate plants on the inside. The building is mostly front lit right now this time of day, so I can't use light versus shade to define the form as much as I'll have to use linear perspective and the contrast of materials. So here I'm painting with a long, flat brush. I'm painting this, these parallel planes of beige stucco. I'm mixing up a darker value of the side wall paint to make a shadow value for this plane. Even though now it's lit by sunlight that's wrapped around the corner, I want to paint it as if it's in shadow, the way it looked when I first arrived, because the sun has moved quite a bit from my right side to my left side from behind me. The damp pieces of paper towel help keep the paint from drying out on the palette, even an hour into the painting process. If they did start to dry out, I'd replace them with freshly squeezed paint. I love the way on a conservatory building, the way you can see the skeleton of the building right through the glass. And I want to paint those spaces between the girders. What I'm doing is painting around the light toned structural lines, letting the white of the canvas board show through. The glass is transparent to the inside of the building, but it also acts as a mirror, reflecting the cool tones of the sky. 
I want to make it a little darker around the outside edge of that tower, so I'm going to add a glaze. This fairly wet glaze over a recently dried area of casein shows how casein is more similar to gouache than it is to acrylic, because acrylic would be thoroughly dried. Here I'm lifting up to the gesso. Now to get those leaves, I'm going to use this dry brush effect to suggest a lot of leaves at once. And I'm using more opaque paint now than I was earlier. With a long flat brush like this, I can get lines by just touching it to the surface and getting a thin, short line segment with the edge of the brush. I can use that same long flat brush with a different mixture of paint to paint the roof shingles on those dormers. Just a quick stroke should cover that, drawn in perspective. And then I can define the edge of those shingles later when this dries. Coming back again with the knife edge of that long flat, I can just suggest those horizontal members going across. They're very delicate and light, so I don't want to get too carried away. For every form that you define, try to suggest another form. I also use a little bit of brown fountain pen you can see on those dormers. That's another nice thing about casein is you can use colored pencil or fountain pen if you want a different kind of drawing tool to combine with the painting tools. By the way, in case you're wondering, no one's paying me to make this video. I just wanted to share with you my interest and enthusiasm for this medium because it's so obscure. And if you want, I'll do future videos where I focus on one particular medium or a combination of media. Since I don't take sponsorships or money for promoting products, and I also don't do Patreon, the best way if you want to support me is to get my download, Casein in the Wild, which you can see in the upper right. Or you can get my books, which are available on my website at jamesgurney.com. You can order my downloads from anywhere in the world, but unfortunately my signed books are only distributed in the USA. But if you want to get a signed book plate to stick in your book, I'll ship that anywhere in the world for free. We also have foreign language editions of my art instruction books like Color and Light and Imaginative Realism. And I'll put links in the description to those foreign publishers. If you have a hard time finding casein where you live, don't worry about it. You can replace it with gouache and get a lot of the same effects. You can even varnish gouache and get a lot of the same look that you can get with casein. Well, the afternoon is wearing on, so I'm going to try to speed up my painting process to finish in time. Sounds like the bullfrogs are starting their afternoon commentary. There's a lot of them in that pond. The reason that I'm here at Stonecrop Gardens is for a plein air painting invitational. Jeanette and I have come up here for several days this summer to come up and paint. I'll have six little paintings all available for sale and I'll show those to you before the end of this video. This semi-public garden is located in Cold Spring, New York. Check first if you want to visit to make sure they're open on the day you want to go. The original owners, Ann and Frank Cabot, built their house as their private residence in 1958 on 60 hilltop acres of fields and woods in New York's Hudson Valley. Frank Cabot founded the Garden Conservancy in 1989, and after his death, the property was passed to a nonprofit corporation. The gardens cover an area of approximately 15 acres. They've got a varied and constantly changing collection of gardens, 
and plants, including woodland and water gardens, a grass garden, raised alpine stone beds, cliff rock gardens, a bamboo forest, and an enclosed English-style flower garden. Unlike oil, where you have to wait sometimes weeks for a paint to be dry enough for a varnish, with casein you can varnish the next day and get a good gloss coat ready for framing if you're doing an exhibition. So it's really ideal for plein air painting. I did some other paintings while I was up at Stonecrop, including one of a dahlia and some poppies. For these I used an unusual technique where I painted the poppies first with fairly transparent intense pigment, then painted a bright lime green undercoat and over that defined those forms. I also painted some rhododendron, cleomies, and roses you may recognize from my flower painting video. And Jeanette painted some beautiful, delicate watercolors, emphasizing some of the architecture, including the conservatory arch, and one of the pit houses with its mysterious sunken entrance. You can see all these paintings at the Stonecrop Artist Invitational Show through October in Cold Spring, New York. How deep that water is, mm. but they really have a lot of. They're all blooming at the same time. 